Betty, I've got it started. Do you want to introduce Michelle? And... I sure do. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm I'm very excited to be able to introduce Michelle Willowsker. Um, Many of us knew her in her role as executive director of the Ingham Conservation District, where she spearheaded and supervised the Mid-Michigan Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, that's a SISMA, from 2015 to 2021. In March 2022, she assumed a position with the Midwest Invasive Plant Network as their full-time coordinator. And we are really interested in knowing about invasive plants. Michelle is a co-director of the Public Gardens as Sentinels Against Invasive Plants Initiative and serves as the administrator for the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference. Her background also includes experience in environmental research and regulation, and she holds a BS in biology from the University of Michigan and an MS in environmental geoscience I didn't even know that was a field <laughs> from Michigan State University. So, wow. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, Michelle. We're thrilled to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for that, for that lovely introduction. Um, let's I try just, sharing. Yeah, let's try yeah, seeing get your screen. Share my screen here. Yeah. And let's get this in presenter view. And we got it. Okay. Bye. Okay, you're seeing it in presenter view because I am not. Oh, there we go. That looks yeah. a little bit better. Now okay. you've got it. Now you're good. Okay. Is that still look all right or are you seeing my side panel as well? Uh nope. You it's all okay. it's all right We're there. All good. Yep. Okay. So I'm Thanks just I'm gonna Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna mute myself, go finish this program, but I will be back. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Carolyn. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, so hi, everybody. Yes. So Michelle Belasker, I'm with the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. And I know I've met many of you through my work with the Conservation District, as, as Betty mentioned. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about um, invasive plants specifically. Um, that's that's what I live and breathe these days. Uh, and my understanding is that there's interest in knowing kind of what's what's on the horizon, you know, what's new to Michigan and what to do if you find these plants and and how do we know what's coming next? I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. So again, I'm going to give you a little introduction to our organization and what we do and some of the resources we have available. Um, I'm going to, it was really hard to narrow down which plants to talk about today because there are quite a few, um, but I'll talk about my, my process, kind of my thought process for the ones we are going to talk about today. It's not going to be too many. I think I've got six or seven on the docket. Um, and again, what are we going to, what do you do if you find them and how to know what's coming next? So the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, um, we just usually call ourselves MIPIN for short. Um, we've been around since 2006, uh, and we, this is the area we work in. So it's nine states plus the province of Ontario. So it's a pretty good sized region. Um, and we just, it's a network. So we do a lot of coordination um, around education outreach. Um, we try to connect like the research community and the land management community so that they're informing each other's work um, and coordinating activities. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of work actually on forestry invasives over the next several years. Um, and our mission is to reduce the impacts of invasive plants in the Midwest. Very, I like that it's a, it's a nice, concise mission statement. Easy to say, not always so easy to do. Uh, so what do we spend our time doing? Um, again, we do a lot of outreach and education, so events like this. Um, Benny mentioned the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference. That's a biennial conference, so the next one is actually in 2024, about this time next year. Uh, it is in Duluth, um, but there's also a virtual option if you can't travel that far. And I'm very excited because we're going to start doing annual conferences. So the Upper Midwest will be every other year, but we're going to be doing a kind of a, a Lower Midwest conference uh, in those in-between years. So we're planning one in 2025 in the greater Cincinnati area, so a little easier to get to. Um, something that's a lot more accessible is our Emerging Midwest Invasives webinar series that's been going on all year. Um, we have 10 plants that we're doing like 35 to 45 minute presentations on. We have experts um, on those specific plants leading those conversations. Uh, there's only one more left this year. It's December 5th, and it's going to be on porcelain berry. 
But um, on my next slide, I've got a list of all the ones that we've done so far, and they've all been recorded and they're available on YouTube. So if there's plants I don't get to talk about today or plants I talk about that you want to know more about, you can hear it directly from the experts on those particular species. And then MIPPIN also does a lot of publications, and I've got a slide to showcase some of those and tell you where you can find them. But to kind of close that loop on the webinar series, um, you can find the link to all of these uh, at mippin.org slash presentations, so the presentation page of our website. Uh, and these are all the different plants we've covered. We had one on Japanese hop just earlier this week. And again, the one coming up on December 5th is on porcelain berry, which is a real um, problematic plant, especially a little further south of us, like that Ohio River Valley. So it's, it is in Michigan. Um, some of you may have come, uh, come across it, um, but not quite as prevalent as it is for our southern neighbors. But it's good to know what's going on south of us because those things are tending to move northward. Some of the publications I mentioned, we have a really nice um, guide on garlic mustard management. If you if you organize any polls or know anybody who does, it's a really nice booklet. It kind of summarizes all the recent research on garlic mustard and then kind of helps decide when and if you should be doing management because it's just, there's so many things to tackle. So this is a nice way to kind of, there's some flow charts in there kind of depending on your site conditions and where you are and the density. Um, how to prioritize management so you're making the best use of your time. We have a nice guide about why should I care about invasive plants. So if you're talking to different groups, if you're talking to boaters or hunters or gardeners, it kind of gives you nice talking points for how to like, how to convey to people, you know, using what they value as kind of a, a way to talk to them about why invasive plants are impacting the things they care about. We have a landscape alternatives guide that's pretty popular. It covers um, it's got native or non-invasive suggestions, suggested alternative plants in, to replace invasive ones. So I know this group's pretty savvy. You probably have lots of these uh, plants in your back pocket already, but it can be nice if you, especially to give to somebody else who's doing, maybe they bought a new property um, or um, they're going shopping for new plants. So it's a great handy little guide. And there's also um, an app version. So the brochure only covers about 13 plants. The app covers almost 50. It can be a nice uh, tool too to like take with you if you're going shopping. If you're going anywhere other than a native plant nursery, sometimes it's nice to like cross check if the thing that you're looking to buy is invasive or not. Uh, and if it is, what are some better alternatives that are also gonna have kind of similar, you know, height, color, or other attributes that you're looking for. So I kind of moved on from talking about outreach and education. We do a lot of work on prevention and early detection because I'm sure all of you know if we can prevent invasive species, if we can catch them early, we save ourselves a lot of time, money, headache, um, and environmental damage. So that's a big part of what we do. And we recently updated um, our keep a lookout flyers is what we call them. We have one for aquatics and one for terrestrial plants. They each cover 16 different plants. And they're double-sided, so the side you can't see in this picture has actually kind of detailed identification and um, habitat information about each of these plants. And then if you see any of these plants, um, highly recommend reporting them to the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, which is a different organization that sounds a lot like us. <laughs> we get, I get a lot of, we, we share, um, we get each other's emails sometimes. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about reporting later in the presentation. Okay, so let's kind of get into the meat of it. So what are some plants that are on, our, on the horizon and how do we know what's on the horizon? So one of the projects that I'm um, spending, spending a lot of time on lately is this Public Gardens as Sentinels Against Invasive Plants. Uh, kind of a mouthful, very cool project though. Um, it's been in existence since about 2016, um, but it's been a lot of program development, kind of a lot of behind the scenes work, building this network. Um, purpose of the project is to use the expertise that Botanic Gardens and Arboreta have um, because they have these incredible collections. They bring in plants from around the world, but they're all recorded, labeled. They monitor these collections. They're usually the first ones to know when plants are escaping from where they've been planted. 
Um, a lot of times these places have natural areas too, so they may have ornamental plants that are now moving into their natural areas. And so most of them, like 80 to 90 percent of gardens, when they are surveyed, are paying attention to this and they're addressing these plants. They're removing them for collections, they're managing them. But what we've discovered is that gardens don't really necessarily talk to each other and they don't really want to share that information outside the garden because they know that, you know, horticulture has been a source of a lot of invasive plants. So they're kind of sensitive about that. So what this project is does has done is created a system basically where gardens have gardens across North America. This is a really big project. Um, follow our guidelines. So they collect information on these escaped plants all in the same way. There's a database where they can input that information and it's it's a controlled access database that's just accessible to public gardens. So they can network and share information. And now that we have we've gotten to a point where we have enough gardens participating, we're able to sort of pull out the trends that we're seeing from that data and share it. And so that was a long walk to tell you that's what this that's what you're seeing here on the right side of the screen is our very first plant alert. So we're going to talk a little bit about this plant Amir cork tree because this has been the most commonly reported plant um, to date um, in our database. Uh, and this plant alert is of, um, accessible on our project website, which I don't think is on here. So I may have to like put that in the chat when I get a second. Um, actually, no, I think it's on my next screen. Ah, there we go. So in addition to our plant alert, which gives you some basic information about the plant, how gardens are ranking it in terms of their level of concern, and what are we recommending? In the case of this amber cork tree, we're making recommendations that more gardens monitor it and report it if it's spreading, um, that we control spontaneous populations, especially trees that have are actually fruit producing, that are contributing to spread, um, not using it in new project plans or new sites or adding it to new pub to public gardens, et cetera. The other thing that we have in addition to that alert is this new dashboard. So this actually is publicly accessible. Um, the full raw data set's not, but this kind of curated version is. And so you can see how many gardens are participating, what state they're located in, and what's most commonly being reported. Um, and this is just a little bit behind the times. We actually have 11 reports now of, um, this might be a little small for you to read on your screen, but Amir cork tree is our number one reported plant. And we've had 11 of our 37 gardens reporting on it. So, you know, like 30% of our gardens say this is a plant of concern. So that's one of the first ones I wanted to talk about today because that has kind of risen to the top through this program. Um, if you're not familiar with this tree, um, it's not really widely used uh, in the, you know, you can buy it still, but it's not uh, real commonly used for landscapes. Um, it gets its name because it has this really thick corky bark. Um, it doesn't actually, it's not actually used to make corks, uh, despite the name. And it spreads because it develops fruits and these fruits turn uh, like a dark black and um, when they're ripe and they're spread by birds. So really common for fruit, um, seed, berry producing trees. We're concerned about it because it's allelopathic. So it has that quality where it alters soil conditions and suppresses the regeneration of native trees in its proximity. And then as you can kind of tell from that picture in the center, it's it's about as tall as it is wide. So it's really sprawling and people that do like it, like it because it's a great shade tree. Um, but that shade can actually in further inhibit like herbaceous growth underneath the tree or other um, the regeneration of other canopy trees that might be more um, preferred. It looks a little bit like Tree of Heaven black walnut, Kentucky coffee tree, but all of those have alternately arranged leaves while Amir cork tree are opposite. So that's a good way to distinguish those. And while we don't recommend this as a tree ID method, it does have this really unique inner bark that's bright yellow. So if you're pretty sure it's cork tree, that's, that's a surefire way to be 100% sure. Um, if you do come across it, this would be a good one to report. 
um, to the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. If you actually find it on your property and you want to know how to manage it, if they're really small, you can pull them if the soil is moist enough. You can probably use equipment to get out juvenile trees, but once they get mature, um, girdling or herbicide treatment is probably the way to go. You can use cut stump or you can use um, basil bark treatment if it's less than six inches in diameter. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. So another way that we determine kind of what the new invasives are that we wanna be paying attention to is we do, Mibin does has been doing an annual survey. So we did one in 2020, and then we did one last year in 22, and now we have a new one out for 2023. Um, and it's at MIPIN.org. It is geared towards people who work professionally with invasive species or are affiliated with an organization. Um, so you can kind of determine for yourself if you are at that expert level, but if you are or know somebody who is, um, we're trying to get responses from our entire region. And we're really interested in these early detection species. So they're not here yet, but they're encroaching on, on our area or they are here, but they're still in really small pockets. But in either case, we're really concerned about their capacity for further spread and we want to make sure they're on people's radar. So when we did this survey last year, um, the top 10, the 10 species that you see listed here are the ones that really rose to the top of the list. It wasn't really a contest. These were the, the, the big the big 10. Um, if you're curious about all of the different species that were named in the survey, not just the top 10, you can find that on our website. And it also shows you what, I have a document that kind of shows what was reported in 2020 and what was reported in 22. And I will update that next year with 2023. So we can kind of see the trend for some of these plants. If they're being reported more frequently, less frequently would be great. <laughs> Sometimes that does happen. But these 10 are the ones that are featured again in that emerging invasive species webinar that I mentioned. So this is how we decided which ones to showcase this year. And Amir cork tree was one of them. So if you want to learn more about the tree I was just talking about, that's a great way to do it. And I also made a flyer of this. So if you wanted to share this with anyone, this is just a free downloader from our website and it just gives you a little bit of information about each of those 10 plants and for which state they're of greatest concern. Um, of those top 10, Japanese silkgrass was number one for those who reported from Michigan. Um, this has been in, known to be in Michigan since 2018, so relatively recent. Um, it's an annual grass and it forms like a carpet once it gets, in, once it gets infested in an area. And I have a picture on my next slide to show you what that looks like. Uh, it spreads by seed. It likes forests and floodplains, kind of moist areas, does not mind shade. So it can thrive even in shady conditions. Um, of course, it'll get more seed production if it's kind of on the edges of those habitats. Um, one of the things about it is that it's weak rooted because it's an annual. So <clears throat> it, it's not a real distinctive looking plant at first glance. So Trying to distinguish it from other things can be a little bit tricky, but because it's an annual, it's weak rooted. So one, one of the ways you can tell if it's silkgrass or not is by just giving it a tug. If it comes out easily, it's a good chance. It's one indicator that it might be silkgrass. Um, it's also kind of, um, for lack of a more scientific word, floppy. So when it gets to be about 18 inches tall, it kind of flops over. Um, and it has kind of fatter, wider leaves than a lot of other grasses. Um, it's about two to four inches in length and about a half to a quarter inch in width. Um, and some people think that the top two leaves can look a little bit like bunny ears, if you want another non-technical non uh, uh, description. It can have this silvery midrib um, down the center of the leaf, but that's not always there. So that's not, um, sometimes you'll hear people say that's a distinguishing characteristic. It's sometimes there, sometimes not. There's some lookalikes. Um, panic grass can look a little bit like this, but that's hairy. Um, Lyrzea grasses and rye grasses are, are, tend to be uh, longer and thinner. Sometimes people do confuse 
young, young stiltgrass and young smartweed. Um, but smartweed is, is a dicot. So it's got branching veins. Um, so, and once they flower, they're going to look very different, of course. But I have heard that that's kind of a common, common one to mix up. Um, but the key thing that I didn't mention yet is stiltgrass gets its name because it has these aerial stilted roots. So that's its most key um, identifying feature. And you can kind of see in this map up here, you know, it's definitely more common south, south of Michigan, um, but we have had, whoops, that was too slow, uh, pockets, especially in the Washtenaw County area and surrounding area, they found a big infestation there that's been um, spreading, um, uh, I think, through the Huron River waters, the Huron River system. So um, if you've been in that area, you may have encountered this. And this is what it looks like when it really gets going. This is when you, they talk about it being a carpeting carpet, you can see that is in, in fact what it looks like. Um, one thing, because we're coming up on the, you know, colder months here, when it dies back, it does leave this beige thatch behind that's actually pretty distinctive. So that can be a way to help with winter ID. They think it was introduced through um, packing material. Kind of kind of looks like that in this um, second picture. And again, it's really spread a lot by seed. There's some kind of interesting research happening in uh, southern Illinois because they found out that turkeys were eating it. Um, so they're doing some research right now to just figure out if the seeds are still viable once they've been consumed and gone through the turkey. <laughs> so we'll let you know about that when we know more. Um, let's see. So if you've got really, if you find this on your property, you've got a really brand new small infestation, you can pull it because it has those weak roots. Um, but once it gets a little more established, you can do mowing. Um, you have to kind of be careful with the timing. You've got to do that before the seed sets. Um, but because seed is the way it produces, um, if you can stop it from seeding, that's really helpful. And another uh, thing that's, important about this that it actually doesn't have a long life in the seed bank. I think it's only a couple of years. So if you can control the seed um, the seed production, you actually have a chance of getting this under control. Okay. So another one I want to talk about. Kind of similar habitat is, is this lesser celandine, or you might know it as fig buttercup, uh, Ficaria verna, uh, it's gone by a few different names over the years. Um, what's really unfortunate about this particular plant is that it's a spring ephemeral. So this competes with our native spring wildflowers. Um, and this also forms really dense carpets along riverbanks and forests. And again, it's excluding those native wildflowers. And it spreads by um, tubers and also um, little bulbils that sort of form at the base of the rosette. It's got these really shiny dark leaves. They're a little bit wavy on the edges. Um, the flowers are pretty, they're, they're showy and they're bright yellow. They're not, in this picture, it's a little bit deceptive though. They're quite small. Um, let's see, the, it blooms at about the same time when skunk cabbage is like mid bloom or at the end of dandelion season. So if you're looking for it, that's kind of the time to keep in mind. Um, it looks a little bit like marsh marigold, uh, Caltha palustris, but marsh marigold doesn't form this carpet of vegetation. Um, it's also found more in wetlands, whereas um, lesser celandine tends to be associated with flowing water um, because it likes, that's a, really helps, flowing water really facilitates its spread. Um, let me go to the next slide here. So you, this is a picture, unfortunately, taken in Michigan. This is at Grand Woods Park. Um, so if you wanted to go see it. <laughs> um, and they have a lot of uh, informational signage out there. They're trying to, to manage it, but it's, you can see it's quite, quite established. Um, but as you can see a little bit here nested in this plant is this bulbul, and that's what can come loose and spread um, during flooding events or um, just when there's flowing water nearby. Um, because it emerges late in the winter and goes dormant over the summer, it's a really short window of control for this plant. So that adds a challenge. Um, so if you 
do have it and you want to do treatment, um, probably want to be looking at, you got to get it, you could do, uh, you could treat it pre-flowering or very early in the flowering process, which would be like mid-April to early May. Um, and a two to three percent aquatic approved glyphosate is pretty effective. Um, you know, always follow the label, label is the law. Um, but you'd also want to use a surfactant aquatic approved um, to get through those waxy leaves. And you don't really, really want to go more than 3%. Um, more is not better in this case. If you hit it with like a 5% solution, what some of my partners have found is that you burn the leaves and you don't actually kill the plant. So more is not better. Okay, one more terrestrial plant I want to talk about um, that you may have encountered is Myla Minute Weed. Um, this is an annual vine. It really likes being on the sunny edges of forests and roadsides. Um, it's another one that emerges pretty early in the season, which gives it a competitive advantage. Um, it spreads by self-pollinated seed and it can produce up to 3,500 seeds per vine. So it's again, really prolific. Um, there are some native plants that look similar like native tear thumbs, but the Milo weed has these kind of distinctive blue fruits that are about the size of a pea. And true to its name, this thing grows fast up to six inches a day. Um, so you can imagine it, it creates pretty dense cover pretty fast. And because it's a vine, it climbs over. It uses these um, recurved barbs on its stem to climb over other plants and even over itself. Um, this was detected in Michigan just, just a few years ago in 2020 in Calhoun County. So you can kind of see the one bubble here in Michigan where it was discovered. It's a lot more common in our sort of these mid-Atlantic states um, where's, where it was originally introduced uh, in the Pennsylvania. Uh, this unfortunately, unlike the stiltgrass I mentioned, this actually has a really long seed bank. It can live about six years. Um, so that makes management a little more challenging once it gets established. Um, there is some good news though. There is a biocontrol that's actually being used in those states where it's really established. Um, there's a black weevil that um, is actually being utilized um, pretty readily. And that can help suppress growth. Um, the thing with biocontrol is it's, a really, it's really nice to have another tool in our toolbox that's not just herbicide. Um, but as bio, the biocontrol organism, you know, feeds on the plant, when the plant population goes down, so does the biocontrol organism's population, right? Because there's less food. So it helps control and keep it, the population in check. It's not going to eradicate it usually. A um, couple other things about this one. Uh, wildlife does eat the seeds, so that helps it spread. They can trans, they can trans uh, port in water. Um, you can do mowing and cutting if you're dealing with this. Um, if you decide to do an herbicide, it also has a waxy cuticle like the lesser celandine does. So you'd want to use a surfactant. Um, and similar, like a 2% um, foliar triclopyr glyphosate is pretty effective. Oh, and I have a picture of the dead material here because this is another one that even when, even when we get into the colder months, um, it kind of looks like brown tinsel. <laughs> um, so it can, so if you see something that looks like this, um, might want to give it a closer inspection because the, the fruits and the barbs will still be visible. Um, I mean, dried up, of course, but um, it can, you can sometimes ID it even in the off season. Okay going to shift gears a little bit here and just mention a few aquatic plants because we've had some new news in Michigan that I just want to want to share. So if you're someone who spends time in the water, there's a few things to look for. Uh, water primrose is one of them. This was a new addition to Michigan's watch list this year. Um, and there's three different species in this category, um, three different Ludwigia species, um, but they all thrive in marshes and wetlands. Um, along shorelines. Um, they have these pretty showy flowers, uh, five or six uh, yellow petals. There's a few known populations in Michigan. There's one that's not shown in this map um, up in Ottawa County and the others are in this Detroit area. 
um, the first detection was in the Detroit National Wildlife Refuge. So that's, I think, what's happening over here. Um, this one is difficult to remove, so early detection is really important. So if you see something that looks like this, um, you will want to report it sooner than later. There's a little bit of debate about its native range um, because it is nat considered native in southeastern states, um, but it doesn't, doesn't obviously cause the same problem that it's having in more northern locations. Um, so in this case, an aquatic approved herbicide is probably the best source of treatment, but um, because it's new, um, there I, I don't have all the guidance on that at my fingertips, but I could look into that if somebody needed me to. We've also had, and then we had our first detection of hydrilla in Michigan this year. Um, so this is a submerged aquatic plant. Um, you can kind of see in the background what it looks like when it takes over an area. Um, there is a native um, uh, Alodia species that looks a lot like this, but the native version only has three leaves in a whorl. This is going to have four to eight, um, and they're going to be serrated, and they have like a spiny mid-vein also. So it's a little bit different. It, it, there is a distinction there. Uh, some other little features, I had to include this other photo because it has these little tiny white flowers. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, it's, but this is prohibited in Michigan. It's on the state's watch list. So definitely report it if you see it. It'll be a top priority for the state or, or SISMAs to manage. And a little bit of, a little bit of maybe good news for the moment is a uh, water soldier. Um, it's been detected in Ontario, so I wanted to bring it to our attention. It's not been detected anywhere in the U.S. yet, and I think partly because our, part, our friends in Canada have been working really hard on this plant. It's interesting. It's submerged. Um, it's a submerged aquatic perennial, but it rises up. It emerges during the summer months, and it likes slow-moving waters. And it has these leaves kind of sword-shaped with a serrated margin. Some people say it looks at the top of a pineapple or like an aloe plant, um, but these edges are sharp enough to injure anyone who's trying to manage the plant or if you come across it when you're swimming. So really uh, not great for recreation. It has these uh, white flowers with, sometimes they're pinkish, uh, with three petals, and they develop dense populations really, really quickly. Um, and of course, when anytime that happens, they crowd out native vegetation, and that's not something we want to see. Um, if you look, if you watch the webinar that we have on this particular plant, you can see how just a handful of pop, handful of plants at a site grew to fill an entire bay in one, in two years. But you can also see that it's very responsive to, to treatment. Um, <clears throat> this is one that can be uh, hand removed. Um, can also, you know, they're also using herbicide, but new detections, you can just um, hand remove these pretty successfully. So that's a little bit of good news. Okay. And, okay, looks like, am I doing okay on time? Okay. Give me a heads up if I, if I need to, if I need to wrap up. Um, so the other last thing I wanted to talk about is invasive plants uh, coming our way in the mid-century. So MIPPIN's done some work on this. Um, with climate change happening, we know that invasive plants are likely to shift their range northward. Um, and I just wanted to let you know about a tool that exists. Um, it was developed um, by the Northeast Risk Management. Um, and in coordination with EDMAPS. EDMAPS is very similar to MISSIN. Uh, it's a national invasive uh, plant database. And <clears throat> it's a way to, it's, well, there's a, I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna try and give you a short version. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit as an introduction, but there is an hour long tutorial on the MIPIN website um, that my predecessor did. It's really good, it's pretty user friendly. Um, and it talks about how this tool was developed and all the different ways you can use it. But I'm just going to give you kind of a shorter version here. So 
a EdMaps has an invasive range expanders listing tool. And so what you can do is you can select a, say the state of Michigan, because that's I think probably our main interest here. Um, and then you can say, I want to know which invasive plants are predicted to move into Michigan, you know, in mid, mid century. So they're talking like 2050, 2060. So this is like what's coming down the pike. And you can choose a radius. Um, I chose 100 miles. So this is within 100 miles of Michigan, what plants are predicted to expand into our area. And it'll produce a list for you. The one thing you do have to do that can be a little intimidating is you have to choose the number of models. All this is is your level of confidence in um, in what in what's being predicted to move into our area. So if you choose one model, it means only one model has to agree that a particular plant is going to be moving into an area. If you choose, I think 13 is the maximum number, it means all 13 models have to have have to agree before a plant will be on your list. So I usually like to pick something like in the seven to 10 model range. So where the majority of models agree. And it'll create a list for you and you can download it. You can learn more about those plans. You can share that list with others. The other thing you can do is actually produce a, a map. Um, so I'm gonna give you the key here first and then I'll show you a map. Um, so anywhere you see orange is where a species is not currently reported, but Future suitability in that area is expected, so the invasive species range is expected to expand. If you see the lilac cover, lilac color, sorry, um, the species is currently there and it's going to continue to be there. Range contraction, invasive species actually won't, isn't predicted to be there in the future. And white means it's not there now, it's not predicted to be there. So I went back to our friend, a Japanese stilt grass here, and I used uh, seven models in this case. And you can see on the left, this is where the plant is currently known to be um, distributed. And when we ran the model, you can see it's, the prediction is that mid-century, it's going to retract a little bit from these lower southern states, pretty be pretty consistent, um, kind of in the, central eastern U.S., but it is predicted to expand, especially into southwest Michigan, into some other Midwest states, and into the northeast. So you can do this for, um, There's, I think they did a model using over 800 different plants. So if you're curious about it, um, you can you can go to edmaps.org uh, forward slash range shift listing and you can play around with this model and if you're curious especially about a particular plant. Uh, a few limitations is it doesn't update so as new distribution information is added it doesn't change the models. They will have to do this work again to update the whole entire system um, and of course you're going to get better results the more distribution data exists on a plant. Um, so just a couple things to keep in mind there. And just this is just kind of some of the results when we've when we've run these models. Some plants that we're expected to see expand into the Midwest. This isn't Midwest Michigan specific. Um, is this list here? And I think some of these are going to look like pretty uh, likely suspects to those of us who follow invasive plants. Calorie pear has definitely been in, on the been expanding. Winter creeper. A lot of these plants. Um, Sericea, kudzu, a lot of these plants are things that I'm hearing some of those public gardens talk about when I uh, visit public gardens around the country. Um, a lot of these names come up repeatedly. So uh, I think these are definitely plants that are on the move. But I've been telling you a lot of bad news, so I want to share a little good news. There are some plants that are expected to contract from the Midwest uh, over the next 20 years or so. And some of these are plants that we're probably dealing with, and you might be, this might be good news. So your buckthorns, your swallowworts, your Canada thistle. Um, so a little bit of good news. Okay. So I wanted to go back and just say, if you 
spot any of these plants that we've talked about today, um, what do you do? So best thing you can do when you live in Michigan is to make a report to MISIN. Again, this Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. Um, you can also report to EDMAPS. I was showing you that um, website. Um, that's a national database used by a lot of other states. But the good thing about using MISIN for our state is that this is the database that the state of Michigan um, professionals use. It's what the CISMAs use, the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, when they are trying to decide what they're going to work on and prioritize for the next year or couple of years. So when you put reports into here, those are the people who are looking at it and, the, and decisions are being made based on what's reported there. So it's really valuable to do. And People don't always take photos when they do a report, but it's so valuable to take photos. And if you want someone like me or someone else to do an ID for you, lots and lots of photos, more than you think you need. Um, the other thing you can do, again, talking about SISMAs, is actually get in touch with your local SISMA. Um, and I will be the first to admit that they can really vary in terms of staffing and funding and capacity, um, but they are, they can at the very least give you some good, really good information about um, identification, management, um, even if they can't come out to your site and do any direct help. And then, you know, if you want to actually take control of the invasive plants on your property, there's some great resources to help you do that. And I'm going to go through a few of them right now. Um, if you haven't been to this website, um, this is this is developed by, by MIPIN, it's, and it is a treasure trove of information when it comes to woody invasives. It covers, I think, oh, now I'm forgetting the number, but at least, at least a couple dozen different invasive woody plants. And it's got identification information, management control, landscape alternatives, uh, if the plant is regulated or not, um, a lot of great information there. There's a blog. Um, that talks a lot about management ideas, um, management as well. Another tool that MIPIN has is a control database. So there's a uh, 45, 50 plants in this database. And it's really great because you can customize a search. So I put in, this is a little hard to read, I know, but if you plug in something like Japanese knotweed and you search control methods, it'll give you all of the sort of, uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin was involved in developing this. So all the method methods have been vetted and it will give you mechanical options, chemical options, and then you can customize it too based on your level of experience, what the habitat type is, what season you're working in, and it'll tell you how effective the method is both immediately and long-term. So it's a really valuable tool. And then we also, on our early detection webpage, have a whole list of um, fact sheets and guides on a whole on a whole list of on a whole bunch of different terrestrial and aquatic um, species. So all the early detection species that I've been referencing today, there should be information about all of them at this website. And we're always looking to add. So if you if you know a really good resource, let me know. And then, you know, the whole point of preventing and managing invasive plants is to have really healthy biodiverse systems. So we also have some resources on site restoration. So I think this group's pretty, um, pretty aware of like the native plant nurseries in Michigan. But if you know somebody who lives out of state or, you know, need more information, we have a native seed and plant supplier list. We also have a contractor list. And there's a restoration webinar series that's really good too. It was done in 2018, so it's not super recent, but it's still really good relevant content. And we also have a couple of guides. Um, the one on the left here, Landscaping with Native Plants to Ward Off Invasives and Benefit Wildlife is a homeowner's, homeowner's kind of best management practice guide for um, landscaping and restoration efforts. And then the other one is kind of geared more towards um, large scale land managers. And then just stay in touch with us. Um, we have a quarterly newsletter. We have a listserv. We've got, you know, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, not always as much on Twitter. Um, 
obviously we have a YouTube channel for all our webinars, or you can just email me. I'm always happy to to uh, talk about invasive plants. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> there is so much to know about all this. And sometimes I think it can feel pretty overwhelming. Um, we we are getting a couple of questions. Um, first one is, does MISIN share data with or collect data from apps like iNaturalist? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, I. Let me, see, let me think. There's some. No, I don't think that they do. But that that would probably be a better question for Misson. Um, but I don't believe so. Okay. And um, another person asks, why has MDARD, and I don't know what that is, but you probably do, not listed any terrestrial plants as restricted or if prohibited? We have still only the three plants designated by the legislature, knotweed, hogweed, autumn olive. Wisconsin has a total of around 100 listed plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I became really aware of that when I started working at a regional level. Um, there, is, there is a lot of um, concern and attention on invasive plants in Michigan. Um, you know, that there's millions of dollars in grant money going to all the SISMAs around the state to do monitoring and management. So there's definitely um, concern and interest in invasive plants, but because of the legislative process that we're currently stuck with, um, any plant that um, the state wants to list does have to go through a weed risk assessment and then go through a legislative approval. So it's a pretty onerous process right now. Um, I do know that there are people at the state who have been trying to get funding to have more staff to actually do that work and get that those regulations done um but it's it's proving to be a, a you know ch a challenging challenging road wow it seems ridiculous to have to bother the legislature with this <laughs> yeah i'm actually on the illinois um terrestrial plant committee and they have um, changed their process and so they aren't and they are now able to um, kind of resume the regulation process. So they're in the process of finally adding plants to their list after a very long time. Wow. Okay, here's another question. How much is, does the DNR actually do to control invasives such as Phragmites? <clears throat> well, Phragmites, um, a lot of the work that's happening in Phragmites is with the Phragmites Collaborative. Um, and they've had there's been a lot of success, I think, with the, so the, the DNR does a lot of delegating to the SISMAs. Um, they work really closely together. And I know there's been a lot of success, like in the UP, when it comes to Phragmites control. Um, it's just really ubiquitous in this part of the, part of the state. So it's, it's a bigger, it's a bigger challenge. Um, and once plants are really well established, it's, it's always, sometimes it's hard to get the same attention to those plants as to the, because the whole, you know, this whole early detection rapid response effort that makes a lot of sense because, you know, it's a lot more um, efficient and economically and environmentally to take on the new invaders than the established ones. But um, now I'm thinking, I'm not sure I answered the question now. <laughs> I got on a roll. <laughs> um, um, me, yeah, see, so was... the question was how much does the DNR actually do to control invasives? Is it even yeah. the DNR that does it? I, the state usually does some um, plant control. I know they've gotten involved like with European frog bit. Um, they've gotten involved with some other kind of early detection species. I don't know off the top of my head how much they've done in Phragmites recently, but again, I know they are supporting SISMAs through grants, and there are SISMAs, especially in like the Saginaw Bay area and the UP that are doing a lot of work on those plants. Question is, is any work being done to remove autumn olive on state lands? And I have to say, it's all over our highway corridors. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, <laughs> it, I've personally removed so much autumn olive. Um, it's, 
I used to manage it, you know, the, the conservation district property used to be a DNR property. So it had, it, there was a time at which it was planted very intentionally for, because it had habitat benefits. Yes. Um, yes. The, the birds love it. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I think that is ongoing, but I, it's probably not uh, the highest priority again, because it's so widespread. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I was wondering about when you were talking about reporting things to miss, and does it make sense to report things that are already well established? I mean, of course, there's garlic mustard and mm -hmm. Japanese um, hedge parsley. I guess we're not calling it Japanese anymore. Hedge parsley mm -hmm. um, on my property every year. And it's just part of my routine that I know when to look for it and when to remove it, but I never think about reporting it. I mean, should we be reporting things that are already expected here? I think the great the greatest value is definitely in reporting things that are new or expanding. Um, that That's the top priority. But it's, you, it's, I don't know, it's nice to have that data though, because sometimes, you know, the more reports we have, the more we can say is something, because there was a, some research recently about, you know, whether a, a paper came out basically saying that maybe garlic mustard is going to be self-regulating. Um, I think that at least MIPPIN's consensus, I can say, is that there's not quite enough data on that yet and that we still think we still support management, um, prioritize strategic management. Um, but if you're reporting some of those common invasives, if we do see declines or um, new funding opportunities become available, it's nice if we have that data. So I don't think it's a waste to do it. But so I wouldn't would, say it's the top priority. So let's say, for example, I can see the rosettes at this time of year. Should I report those? Should I wait till next spring? Uh, I don't know that there's a terrible. I think either one is fine. I don't know that there's a big difference in, in whether you would report something now or in the new year. Um, someone else asks, MDARD has authority to list terrestrial plants and DNR to list aquatics since 2015. Section, oh, this is a very informed person, Section yes. 41302 of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act. Yeah. Some that's, I guess, guess that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, and and yeah, and I I should probably qualify that I am not I am not deeply uh, versed in the in the um, the regulation process uh, in Michigan. So there may be people on the call that have more information about the details of that process than I do. Um, I just I just like to vouch for the state because they've supported a lot of my invasive species efforts over the year. I know they care about this issue. You know, I had an interesting experience last spring with a neighbor who asked me, because she knows that I know more about plants than she does. She asked me to come over and look at some things on her property. And one of the things she was very happy to show me was this beautiful yellow flowering plant, <laughs> which was Picaria verna, which she had put in her wetland. Okay. And I spoke to her very seriously about the fact that this was invasive and she needed to dig it up right away and what to do with it. And I'm just not really sure that she took that seriously. She also showed me some burning bush, which she was dividing and planning to take to her garden club sale. And I explained that that was invasive too. And she really shouldn't be giving any of that away. And actually she should get rid of it all. So, yes. you know, part of it is talking to people who aren't on this whole wavelength. How do we do that? Do you have any advice for us about that? Well, I, I mean, I, there is that, there is the guide that MIPPIN developed and it it's, it's a nice, it's a nice um kind of cheat sheet, if you will, of like, how to how to talk to people about invasive plants because sometimes you know if i don't have my hat on <laughs> if i'm talking to like close family or friends sometimes i i realize that i i'm talking about it in a way that's disheartening or just or or a little aggressive you know and it's really important to 
talk about them to meet people with what their meet people where their values are right if people care about the lands where they want to hunt or the lakes they want to boat on or um you know whatever it is um it, that can really help kind of bridge the gap in making the issue relevant to them yeah you're right it can be very disheartening because we're so involved in this mm -hmm. it's clear to us what it means to say that something is invasive and it's is kind of amazing to talk to somebody that has really no concept about that yeah yeah and i know sometimes i get to the questions of like well they they just keep coming there's nothing we can do and it's and I just always go back to the idea that biodiversity is really important, right? If we're going to have ecosystems that are resilient and healthy and and if we want to keep enjoying the lands that we have or all the different ways that we like to enjoy them, then it does matter. And I do like to try to share success stories whenever I come across them because they do exist. <laughs> and when you see a site that's been restored and native plants are coming back and wildlife is coming back. It's, it really, it really helps. The, I shared a video, I think just last week that the Missouri, oh, uh, Missouri Prairie Conservation. I don't know if I'm getting that name right, but they did a really nice like 20 minute video with a landowner just walking around her property. Uh, it was really lovely. And she was just talking about all the different invasive plants that they were managing and showing all the places that had been kind of restored and all the wildlife they were seeing. And it's, and talking about it kind of just as a journey, you know, it's taking years, but they're conserving this land that's been in the family for generations. And it's a really nice, um, positive, really informative, but very positive take on invasive management. So um, if someone has, I mean, it's 20 minutes, so someone has to be a little bit, you know, my, more than a little bit interested, but it's a really good video. If you go to our Facebook page, you can find it. Nice. Do you have any thoughts or advice on reed canary grass, which I feel will still be here when I die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, not it. I don't have that. I haven't worked a lot on that plant personally, so I don't, I don't have a lot at my fingertips, but um happy to be happy to look into anything if I if that was helpful I have been told that you have to herbicide it cut it dig it up and then do it again mm, well, <laughs> which rough. so so far has been my experience it's I find on my property is the hardest one um okay. to get rid of it's quite aggressive all right, I have to, I'll have to look into that one a little bit. I'm very, I mean, I'm very familiar with the plant, but I haven't had to do management of it personally. So I have unfortunately haven't had, fortunately have not had that same experience that you have. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Is there, are there any more questions that people have that you want to put in the chat before we close? Or in the Q and A? Oh, here's another one. Great. Reed canary grass. Okay. I will, uh, I will see, I will put together some resources on that plant. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yes, it's, um, it's a lot of work to dig it out, but mm -hmm. I feel like digging it out or herbiciding it, but then, you know, you're working in a wetland and I, I'm not licensed to spread herbicide in a wetland. I don't feel very comfortable doing that. So it's, um. It's kind of tough to know how to do it responsibly because I also don't want to hurt any amphibians, which I know can be very sensitive. Yes, they can. Yeah, definitely, you know, if aquatic approved, but yeah, that wetlands are 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 a very sensitive habitat to be concerned about. Any other questions from the audience this is so weird to be remote like this it's yeah, like we can't look around and just look <laughs> at people's faces but this is you know to to the membership i have to say remember that this is what people asked us to do for the winter months so november january remember there's no meeting in december 
November, January, and February, we are we will be on Zoom, and um, then we will be back live in March. So thank you so much, Michelle. This has been just great. And thank you all for attending. It says here we had 23 participants, so I think that's pretty darn good. And um, happy holidays, everybody. Thanksgiving is next week. So thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah, Take thanks care. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everyone. All right. Good night.